Welcome. Please take your seats for the closing plenary of the 2012 Left Forum. We have a lineup of brilliant speakers, and we want to exult in what was a great conference. 4,000 people. How many were here for the first time? That's a lot of people. Good for you. Come back, too. At this point in the conference, a lot of us are a little bit tired, very exultant. We're also feeling very warm and fuzzy. We want to hug you all uh, for coming, for being one of us. And you know, at this conference, we have felt more strongly, I think, than ever before, that the conference is part of a great movement that is unfolding in the United States and in the world. And something brought us kind of to a head, our participation in the movement last night. Some of you were here for Michael Moore's always fun presentation in the evening. And Michael invited everybody in the audience to, after the, his talk was over, uh, to join him in a march to Zagati Park. And a lot of people, a lot of people took him out, up on that. And uh, there was a great banner, Occupy Wall Street. And outside the doors, uh, there were a lot of occupiers waiting for us and chanting, whose streets, our streets, whose streets, our streets. And the assembled people walked down, I guess that's Spruce Street, uh, toward the avenue. And when they got to the avenue, there were really a lot of cops. <laughs> so I asked. I had to go veer off. I was with some Italians who wanted dinner. Uh, the, I had to veer off, but I asked some of the people who stuck with the march and the events that followed to write it up. This is a composite report. They said, the march took off. We were on a sidewalk marching from the left forum to Zuccotti. Many cops marched on the side, on the curb side, right alongside us. I felt both exasperated and a little intimidated. A very long line of police cars drove on the street behind us, blocking traffic across many streets. Ironic, if a kind of kind of hilarious, that it was the cops who were brought blocking traffic. Police mopeds lined the perimeter of the park, that's Zuccotti Park. Occupiers had to squeeze in between them in order to enter the park. Got in the park. It was wonderful. People chanting, dancing, summoning, drumming. Lots of people and energy. It felt like October. People made speeches about various topics including future general assemblies, and inspiring speeches about why we are here. Afterwards, at 11.30 p.m., people, the police told people to leave. Most people left. Some people remained and sat in locked arms. They were arrested. More than 70 people were arrested. The police's rationale was that occupiers had tents, but I don't think there were any. In other words, these were not occupiers because they didn't have tents. There was violence. Bagpiper's bagpipe was smashed by a cop. 
A girl with asthma was refused medical attention. A medic's head was smashed into a window. Broken ribs and concussions from batons. Today, many are still in jail. Nobody is at the park now. It's barricaded. There are 50 people outside the jail at 100 Center Street for support. We remain strong. That's the end of the report on how Left Forum joined the movement. I want to say just a few words. I'm not going to make a big speech. Uh, we've got great speech makers here. I want to say a few words about what I found so thrilling about this convening. Not only that there were so many of us, but that we really came from all parts of the left. We really did. There were Catholic workers here. Uh, there were social democrats here. There were democratic socialists here. There were socialists here. There were anarchists here. There were some communists here. And, you know, in every session I attended, and I think I have been at every session, uh, at every session I attended, people talked to each other with goodwill. I found that so wonderful, as if we had all finally realized that our enemies are not here inside this room. Our enemies are not us. We can work together because we have a really v huge task before us of transforming America and the world. And there's room for all of us. We don't know exactly what is the right thing to do. None of us can be confident. We have to listen to others, others, and we have to make space in our great movement for religious leftists, for people who think peace is the main issue, for people who think that wholesome food is what we really need, for ecologists, and for the old-fashioned social democrats, democratic socialists, socialists, and communists. So we are all together. We have to listen and move over so that we can stick together. This is a remarkable achievement. I think it's owed in so far. It may be strained, but I think it's owed in part to the goodwill that Occupy itself has shown to diverse, diverse orientations. <laughs> so I think we're off to a very good start. At the closing plenary, we customarily thank all of the people that helped us do this conference. And you know, it is a conference that is run by, largely by volunteers. We have a few part-time staff people. Uh, our board is a volunteer and a working board. And uh, we have a full-time coordinator, uh, Seth Adler, who I think we should thank right now. But we have a lot of other people who are staff and organizers. And I think they each deserve to have their names yelled out. Uh, so I'm going to take the time to actually read the names. Satcha Amri, Aparna Ritchie, 
David Nelson, Young Chow, Carla Cote, Crystal Tong, Ishtag Alam, Nick Legowski, Mia Ragazzino, Mike McCabe, Tao Fun, Jeremy Fisher, Donna Trung, Maxime Hammer. Don't you like the variety of the names, too? I really like that. Lucky Ling, Carol Woodward, Tony Gal Galliani, <laughs> Robert Blackman, Stefan Boatwright, Anne Larson, Harshal Shah, Flacow. Where's Stefan Boatwright? Uh, Mark, for developing our database, Mark Lipkuman, did I pronounce it? Eric Goldhagen, and then our volunteers. Oh, I love those volunteers, because I'm always lost here. And volunteers just magically appear <laughs> and tell me how to find the restroom. The so our volunteers, Natasha Katerinopoulos, Tamar Surabishvili, I didn't do that right, Nicholas Glastonbury, Caitlin Rigsby, Tom Bucalli, Tony Buontempo, Sarah Dunn, F F14 <laughs> Company? I don't know who that is. <laughs> Jeff Erickson, Lucky Ling, Harsh Luch Lochun, Kyla Mackey, Jade Milan, Pooja Patel, Cut Candace Paul, Zachary Smith, Carol Wood, Ralph Yazo, Marie Simmons, and a very special thanks to Expert Events and their staff, and to artist Katie Shelley for Left Forum's illustrated graphics, and to Joel Simpson for photographs. Abiding thanks to Open Flows. You can see it takes a lot of cooperation to put on the Left Forum. Let's give a hand to all those people. And now to our speakers. Uh, our first speaker, everybody wanted to be last when I discussed it with them, but I pushed them. Our first speaker is Arun Gupti. He's a founder of The Independent and the Occupied Wall Street Journal, and was formerly the international news editor of The Guardian Newsweekly. He has visited more than 30 occupations in 21 states since October, covering the Occupy Wall Street movement nationwide for Salon, The Guardian, The Progressive, In These Times, Alternet, and other publications. Since the fall of 2011, he has helped set up Occupy newspapers in cities including Chicago, Portland, Tampa Bay. Gupta is a regular commentator on Democracy Now!, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Al Jazeera, and Russian, te uh, Russian Television or Russia Today? Television. He is writing a book on the decline of American empire for Haymarket. Uh, our first speaker, Arun Gupta. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for coming out today. Um, it's a real honor to be here. i invited to be at the closing plenary for the Left Forum. Um, I, I certainly want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for putting this together and inviting me. I'd like to thank my publisher, Haymarket Books, uh, which is a great press, and uh, they've been incredibly supportive uh, to me over the years, even though I still haven't uh, delivered a manuscript. <laughs> uh, I'd uh, like to give a shout out to Free Speech TV, uh, which is broadcasting these proceedings, uh, and is a very important media outlet. 
Um, and finally, I'm, I'm sure many folks know, but I just wanted to emphasize that uh, there will be the march at 8 p.m. Uh, at the Red Cube uh, in support of the people who were arrested yesterday. And it's important that you know, we do get out of the forum and into the streets. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of uh, weave together an overview of uh, the last few months. I met Nomi on a bus in Baltimore. She was from Wisconsin and had been involved with Occupy Wall Street. She was part of Occupy Judaism and fondly recalled the Yom Kippur services she attended at the occupation with hundreds of other people. Nomi explained that for the first time, she and many of her friends were able to combine the spiritual and radical dimensions of Judaism. The occupation gave them a fuller sense of being by unifying their religious, cultural, and political life. The conversation felt silent as the bus rolled along. Suddenly, Nomi turned to me and excitedly announced that I met my girlfriend at Liberty Plaza. I smiled and responded, that's why Occupy Wall Street matters. The movement was more than a movement. It was transformative and even life-changing. And it allowed people to experience themselves as complete social beings, not just as angry and outraged protesters. Nomi said she was no longer involved in the movement, which I thought was yet more evidence why the actual occupations were so important. Just a couple of weeks earlier, my partner Michelle Fawcett and I visited one of the last remaining occupations, Occupy Fullerton in Orange County. We heard they were having an Occupalooza. Being a warm, sunny day like it usually is in the OC, we cruised Fullerton's insipid car architecture until we happened upon the incongruous site of a tent village. It was a familiar scene, about 40 tents, most shielded by blue tarps, and small knots of people playing music, smoking, and lounging in the afternoon sun. The party was on top of the hill, overlooking the Occupy Fullerton camp, we were told. Before hiking up there, we encountered Wolf, a 25-year-old transgender native of Fullerton. Wolf had been involved for only a month, but had jumped feet first into the movement. He explained how Occupy Fullerton is lobbying the city council to pass resolutions on debts ranging, on issues ranging from Citizens United to predatory debt. His cool-headed explanation of how credit card companies trap unsuspecting students in a cycle of debt gave way to a passionate embrace of the Occupy movement as a welcoming space for him and his intersex partner. As we interviewed Wolf, John Park hung on the edge. When we turned to Park, a Korean American with two children in college, he launched into a blistering critique of the ideology of free trade, expertly citing the academic literature on the subject. That a middle-aged immigrant computer programmer could find common cause with a transgendered youth activist speaks to the raw ideological and emotional power of the twin slogans, we are the 99% and Occupy Wall Street. Sure, there was abundant anger and frustration around America before Liberty Park was occupied. But the occupation crystallized who is to blame for the economic crisis and who are the legitimate people. Anyone could walk into the public space, share their stories, find people with similar grievances, and help build the many societies. For many, it created an organic, holistic community. The Occupy movement, though, wasn't just a rejection of Washington and Wall Street. It revealed the failings of liberals, unions, and the left. New activists didn't first have to master volumes of social and cultural theory. They didn't have to attend grueling anti-oppression workshops or learn to pepper their comments with academic jar jargon to join the movement. Neither did it require consultants, focus groups, or polling to occupy the center of American politics with a radical message. And the forum was not the same old rallies with canned chants, pre-printed protest signs, and preaching to the choir. The loss of public space is, is an undeniable setback, however. Creating democratic town squares in the in, in the face of power attracted the huge number of people who bought the movement to life. Now that nearly every one of the hundreds of occupations that popped up last fall have been booted out of their communal space, it's tempting to say the next phase, Occupy 2.0, is underway. No doubt Occupy has an enviable brand, significant public support, and energized movements around housing, labor, finance, electoral reform, corporate accountability, faith, the food supply, and pretty much any issue you can think of. 
The secret of Occupy's strength lies in its ability to disrupt power in simple ways, like the mic check and grants, such as by occupying public space, even if that space is now a rarity. Occupy Wall Street does re retain a disruptive capacity that defies prediction. It can be seen from Occupy the SEC, which released a stunning 325-page critique of the VOCA rule to Occupy Our Homes, which has successfully engaged in more than two dozen foreclosure and eviction defenses thus far. These are victories that are symbolic, putting financial regulators on notice that they are being watched and real by keeping families in their home. Victories are essential because they sustain the moment, the movement, yet it's still in its infancy. Compared to the problem today in terms of occupying our homes, four million families have lost their home to foreclosure since 2007. And compared to the scope of resistance in the past, some historians claim that in eight months in New York City in 1932, 77,000 evicted families were moved back into their homes by unemployed council activists. To notch far-reaching victories, the Occupy movement needs allies with millions of members and access to resources. In short, the beleaguered labor movement, which has found a lifeline in Occupy. There's a growing recognition that organized labor has been boxed in by laws and rulings that have blunted the strike, its most potent weapon. Labor organizers across the country recognize occupiers can take risks unions are unable to or are unwilling to. By moving beyond the workplace as the locus of the struggle between labor and capital, Occupy has introduced creative tensions that benefit unions, even if they feel their toes are being stepped on. The December 12th West Coast port shutdowns organized by the Occupy movement caused friction with the leaders of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union who opposed the blockade attempts from Long Beach to Vancouver. But when occupiers started organizing flying pickets to aid the Longshore Union in confronting an agribusiness giant, EGT, that was trying to freeze out the union workforce at the port of Longview in Washington State, the corporation blinked and struck a deal with the union. Relations are being tested further. Some occupiers are pushing for a general strike on May Day, while many labor activists call it unrealistic, without months of education and organizing among the rank and file. Many occupiers respond, if not now, when, and point out that Occupy Wall Street would have never happened without audacious risk taking. Occupy and organized labor may also find themselves on opposing sides as unions throw money and troops into President Obama's reelection battle, while the Occupy movement mobilizes to occupy the Democratic National Convention and its Republican counterpart. While Obama has adopted Occupy Wall Street ideas in running on a platform of economic fairness, Occupy Wall Street is no left-wing tea party. Having interviewed hundreds of occupiers across the country, it's safe to say they fall into three camps. Those who didn't support Obama in 2008, those who voted for him last time but will not this time, and to be honest, the plurality who say they will hold their nose and vote for him. Nonetheless, they all agree that the electoral system is broken, which is precisely why they flock to the Occupy movement as an alternative method of building and leveraging power. Now, power means different things to different people. Many people involved in the Occupy movement do want to enlist in policy battles and engage in electoral campaigns. But the beating heart of the movement is about creating societies that embrace the vibrancy of daily life instead of reshuffling the political class in Washington. Back at Occupy Fullerton, when we finally climbed up the hill to get to Occupalooza, we found a bowl-shaped grass amphitheater fringed by palm trees and a house band jamming with a few dozen people grooving to the music. Being California, there were frisbees, sunbathers, and stoners. Being winter, kids were sledding, even if it meant they were shrieking as they bounced along a dirt gully gouged from the hillside. Lupe Barrios eyed our camera and notepad, bounced over to chat us up. He said he was from Tucson. His right calf proclaimed, Echo on San Diego, and he said, I'm here for a fun, not politics. But within a minute, he was talking about how immigrant rights are workers' rights, and said, my mother lives in a cage wherever she goes because of social and class oppressions. It was festive, giddy, and unpredictable. The left is abundant in anger. The Occupy movement has turned that into joy. This country is floundering in despair. Occupy has given countless people hope. It is these emotional truths that make the difference. If the movement becomes predictable, the faces all look familiar, and the organizing feels like drudgery, then it will have lost. 
For now, no one knows what will happen next, and that's a wonderful thing. Now, that's where it's supposed to end, but I do want to give a quick addendum uh, of about two minutes to talk about yesterday, because I think it is very important to talk about where the movement is at this moment. Um, one journalist I talked to I, who's done terrific work, and uh, Nathan Schneider, uh, who was out there all day, I was there part of the day, he said it was like six months of Occupy in one day. It went from occupation to festival and carnival to confrontation, to eviction, to defiance. There was a clear narrative thread, and that's very important. That's what I've learned as I've gone across the country. The telling of stories are what's matter, what matters. The problem is at this point, the narrative is becoming about police and protesters, cameras and brutality. Now, it's not my role as a journalist, I know others think otherwise, to tell the movement what to do. I, I try to more raise questions, listen to people, and make observations. And I think fundamentally that militancy is important, and that has become a, an unfortunate controversy over the issue of, of black bloc tactics, uh, because numerous times uh, black bloc tactics have worked um, and have been very effective in protecting people. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there is also a danger of misdirected militancy. We need to be thinking more about strategic militancy, such as the December 12th port shutdowns. That may involve battles with cops, but they are about something fundamentally different. In, in this case, it was trying to show power against capital and b build links with workers. I saw the same thing in the Inland Empire, where protesters successfully used black bloc tactics to defend themselves. Uh, against the police, and they were able to aid the campaign of warehouse workers there who are trying to organize against Walmart. But when yesterday we left uh, from the left forum and we were marching up Spruce Street, you know, I'll admit, I was in the middle of the street, it was giddy, I was enjoying it, there was a sense of empowerment in yelling whose streets, our streets. But the question is, was it strategic? Now. I'm no pacifist. Um, I believe the pol police are often our enemies. In fact, virtually all the time, they're our enemies. But they're not the ones who crash the global economy. And we make a mistake if, if we let this become a narrative about police and protesters. And we need to think about targets. And we need to start creating di discipline while not leaving aside the carnival and theater. What I saw a lot of yesterday was the, the crowd was surfing on emotion. Uh, not thinking through strategically because we haven't created the structures yet. And, and we need to think about how are we actually going to do that. And I think one of the most important things, and I, I direct this to every single person in here and who's been at the left forum, that the movement really needs intellectuals. It needs organizers. It needs all of you. It, it needs you to engage with the movement at every single level. There's probably 10,000 years of organizing and intellectual experience uh, in this room. And the, the problem is too many people are still sitting from afar making pronouncements um, when they should be doing the difficult work of going, and it is difficult, but the movement is in a very fragile state at this point, and, and it's like a glass egg. And, and there are fractures appearing in it. We don't know what's going to be born, but as to echo Francis, we need to keep it together so we can see what is born instead of letting it fall apart. So I would hope that people go out of here and think about how exactly they're going to engage in the movement to help it create something that'll last for years and really transform our society and social relations. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is the virtually legendary John Holloway, a professor of sociology in the Institute of Social Science and Humanities of the Bene Merida University, Autonomous University of Puebla in Mexico. This has been his home since 1991. His work is associated with the Zapatista movement and has also been taken up by some intellectuals asso associated with the Picateros in Argentina, uh, with Abalali, Base, Mon this I don't know how to pronounce, Majandolo, Mon 
movements in Europe and North America. His publications include Crack, uh, Crack Capitalism, uh, 2010, and I think most famously, Change the World Without Taking Power, and Zabatista, Rethinking Revolution in Mexico, that he co-edited with Eloina Palaez. Uh, and now I give you Professor John Holloway. Thank you. Very many thanks, Francis, for that absolutely intimidating introduction. <laughs> Very many thanks as well to the, to the organizers of this event for inviting me and to you all for being here. For me, it's really, really delightful um, and also a little bit frightening because this is actually the first time I've ever spoken in the heart of the evil empire. <laughs> My warmest thanks to, to the gatekeepers at the airport yesterday who let me come in, let me come and visit you in this land of freedom, <laughs> who allowed me to come and see you in your jail. Perhaps they let me in because they didn't realize that there is a mutiny in the jail, a revolt at the heart of the empire. We are here, we are here to celebrate 2011, and it's overflowing into the current year, 2012. A year of glorious revolt in all the world. A year in which our insubordination made it clear that we are the crisis of capital. We are the crisis of capital and proud of it. Enough, enough of saying that the capitalists are to blame, that it's the banker's fault. The very notion is not only absurd but dangerous because it constitutes us as victims. Capital is a relation of domination. The crisis of capital is the crisis of domination. The dominators are not able to dominate effectively. And then we go into the streets and tell them that it is their fault. What are we saying? That they should dominate us more efficiently? <laughs> it's better, surely, to take the simpler explanation and say, that the relation of domination is in crisis, if the relation of domination is in crisis, it is because the dominated are not docile enough, that they are not prostrating themselves sufficiently. The inadequacy of our subordination is the cause of the crisis. Capitalism is not just a system of injustice, it is a system of accelerating exploitation, a system of intensifying destruction. And this can be theorized in many ways. It can be theorized in terms of the law of value and the, 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 the constitution of value by socially necessary labor time. Or it can be theorized in terms of the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. But what it means is that capitalism is a dynamic of attack. There is a unending drive to go faster, an unending transformation of what capitalist labor means. And this means not only the intensification of labor in the factories, but the ever-increasing subordination of all aspects of life to the logic of capital. The very existence of capital is a constant turning of the screw, and crisis is quite simply the manifestation of the fact that the screw is not being tightened fast enough. Somewhere it is meeting resistance. Resistance on the streets and in the squares, perhaps. Organized resistance, certainly. But also 
It may just be the resistance of parents who want to play with their children, lovers who want to spend an extra hour in bed, students who think that they can take time to criticize humans who still dream of being human. We are the crisis of capital. We who do not bow low enough. We who do not run fast enough. And in this situation of crisis, there are really only two solutions. One solution is to say, sorry, sorry. We apologize for our lack of subordination and we call for more employment, more jobs. Please exploit us more. <laughs> and we shall work harder and faster. We shall subordinate every aspect of our lives to capital. We shall forget all this childish nonsense about playing and loving and thinking. This is the logic of alienated labor, the ineffective logic of the struggle of and by labor, understood as alienated labor, against capital. The problem with this solution is not only that we lose our humanity, but we reproduce the system that is destroying us. If we are successful, unlikely, but if we are successful in helping capital to overcome its crisis, then the faster, faster, faster will continue the subordination of all life life, human and non-human, to the requirements of value production will be intensified. And then there'll be another crisis and so on. So on, not so on forever, but so on and it may not be very far until humanity is extinguished. And the alternative, the alternative, and really I think it's the only alternative, is to say openly, no, sorry, we, are the crisis of capital, and we will not yield. We will not accept what capital is doing to us. We take pride in our lack of subordination, in our refusal to bow to the capitalist logic of destruction. We are proud to be the crisis of the system that is destroying us. Look at Greece, look at Greece, the very center of today's financial crisis. There, the crisis is very clearly a crisis of insubordination. The capitalists and their politicians stated very clearly, the Greeks do not, know, do not bow low enough. They do not work hard enough. They like to sleep siestas <laughs> and to go out at night. And now they say, now they must be taught a lesson. They must learn what it means to be true capitalist workers. And by teaching the Greeks a lesson, they say we will also be teaching the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Italians and the Irish and all the other insubordinates of the world. And in this situation, there are really only two possible options. One is to say, no, no, that's not true. We are good workers. Just give us more jobs and we will show you how hard we can work. We will rebuild capitalism again in Greece. And the other option is to say, yes, you are quite right. We are lazy. We are lazy and we will fight for the right to be lazy. We will fight to do things at our own rhythm and in the way that we consider proper. We will fight for our siestas and we will fight for going out late at night. <laughs> so no to capital and no to capitalist labor because we know, we all know, that capitalist labor is literally destroying the earth destroying the conditions of human existence. We shall build a different sort of sociality. 
And the first solution, the first solution, solution of saying, no, no, we are good workers, seems simpler, it seems more obvious, but it may well, it probably is just an illusion, because most commentators think that the recession in Greece will continue for years, no matter how well the Greeks behave themselves. And if you want to know what prolonged capitalist failure looks like, prolonged capitalist failure without hope of radical change, then just look across the border and look at the tragedy in Mexico. Or look closer, look at your own inner cities. That is what capitalist failure looks like. The other option, the option of saying no, no to capitalism, we will try and build a different sociality is what many Greeks are trying to develop at this moment by choice and by, by necessity. If capital cannot provide the basis of life, then we must do it in other ways, by forming networks of mutual support, by proclaiming no house without electricity, and getting together groups of electricians who go around reconnecting people as soon as their electricity supply is shut off. by the non-payment of road taxes, of road tolls, and of exceptional taxes, through the Papas movement, by which farmers take their potatoes and other vegetables direct to the cities to be distributed at low price to the people directly, by the establishment of free shops, the creation of community gardens, the return to the countryside, and just beginning also, the recuperation of factories, at least the recovery so far, of a hospital and of a newspaper. This is a lot more complicated and far more, a far more experimental way forward in which there is no correct line, there is no revolutionary purity. Quite possibly, our prefigurative forms of sociality are not yet strong enough to ensure our survival and there have to be compromises. But that is clearly the direction in which we must push, clearly the direction in which we are pushing and are being pushed. This world we are trying to create is a world without answers, a world of asking we walk, a world of experiment. But we are guided by our no to the other inhuman, obscene, destructive system of capitalism and guided by a utopian star distilled from the hopes and dreams of centuries of struggle. Crisis then confronts us with these two options. Either we take the highway of subordination to the logic of capital in the clear knowledge now that this leads directly to the self-annihilation of humanity. Or else we take the hazardous paths, many paths, of inventing different worlds here and now and through the cracks we create in capitalist domination. And as we invent new worlds, we sing loud and clear that we are the crisis of capital. We are the crisis of the rush towards human destruction and proud of it. We are the new world that is pushing through. Get out of the way, capital. speaker is Chris Hedges, a cultural critic and author who was a foreign correspondent for nearly two decades for the New York Times, the Dallas Morning News, the Christian Science Monster, 
monitor. <laughs> and national public radio. He reported from Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and won the prize for explanatory reporting for the New York Times coverage of global terrorism. And he received the 2002 Amnesty International Global Award for Human Rights Journalism. Hedges is the author of the bestsellers American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, Empire of the Liberal Class, um, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle and Death of the Liberal Class, and he was a National Book Critics Circle finalist for his book, War is Force That Gives Us Meaning. He is a senior fellow at the Nation Institute and writes an online column for the website Truthdig. He's ta taught at Columbia University, New York University, Princeton University, and the University of Toronto. And he currently teaches inmates at a correctional facility in New Jersey. I give you Christopher Hedges. Thanks, and, and thanks, I mean, John's right. Um, we have so little time left. Um, in theological terms, I can't escape my seminary background. This is literally a battle for life against the forces of death. Alexander Herzen speaking a century ago uh, to anarchists uh, about uh, th that their task was not to reform the system but to overthrow it, said, we think we are the doctors, we are the disease. And that's precisely what we have to be if we are going to survive as a species. Um, I covered movements around the globe uh, all of the revolutions in Eastern Europe, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania, all of the street demonstrations that brought down Slobodan Milosevic, the first Palestinian uprising or intifada, the second Palestinian uprising uh, that took place uh, about five years later. And I've learned that movements are organic. Uh, they have a life, a kind of centrifugal force, that even the purported leaders of those movements do not understand or grasp. The fundamental task of the security and surveillance state, and all of these movements took place in states that had draconian forms of control, the Stasi in East Germany, for instance, although I would argue that at this point the security and surveillance state in the United States is the most repressive apparatus and intrusive apparatus uh, probably in human history. Um, their fundamental goal is to sever a movement which articulates the truth as Occupy did from the mainstream. And as probably some of you know in this room, I have been deeply critical of the black bloc. Now, let me preface that, first of all, by saying that that's not an attack on anarchism. I don't particularly like labels, uh, but if you had one that you had to affix to me, uh, it would certainly be as an anarchist. I believe in a permanent alienation from power, uh, a perpetual conflict with centers of power, no matter uh, who holds that power. I come out of the Julian Benda vision of the world, his 1922 book, Treason of the Intellectuals, that said that you can either serve privilege and power or justice and truth. But the closer that you go towards making concessions to those who serve privilege and power, the more you diminish the capacity for justice and truth. And my book, The Death of the Liberal Class, chronicles the destruction of populist and radical movements that were the force in this society that opened up democracy, that provided all the true correctives to American democracy. It never came from the white power elite. It came from the bottom. The Liberty Party that fought slavery, the suffragists, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, none of these movements achieve 
formal positions of power. And yet, in April 1968, one could argue that Martin Luther King was the most powerful figure in this country until his assassination, because when he went to Memphis, 50,000 people went with him. And what has happened to Occupy is that the external forces of repression have been matched by sophisticated and deep internal forces of repression. And the goal is to sever the movement from the mainstream, to make the mainstream frightened of the movement. What terrified the power elite were the mothers and fathers from the suburbs outside of New York showing up in Zuccotti Park with their strollers. Because they knew that if this movement spread, if it could begin to pull the kinds of numbers that I saw in Leipzig and Alexanderplatz and Wenzela Square, the pillars which are fragile that hold up the systems of power, including the foot soldiers of the elite, the police, could be internally divided and internal division creates paralysis. And so my criticism of the black box is not a criticism of violence. I'm not a pacifist. I was in Sarajevo during the war when it was being hit with 2,000 shells a day, constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day, 45 of my own foreign journalists killed. And we were surrounded by a trench system and understood that if the Serbs broke through that trench system, a third of the city would be slaughtered and the rest would end up in refugee and displacement camps. And that wasn't theory because all we had to do was look at Vukovar or the Drina Valley. At that moment, I understand why you pick up a weapon. And yet, I believe that at this moment, our true power, as Václav Havel wrote, comes, whatever that incongruity is, from our powerlessness. I think that is our greatest weapon. We cannot compete internally or externally with the forces of the security and surveillance state that were on public display last night because they can't allow this movement to take root again. Orwell said that all totalitarian societies ru rule through fraud and force, and now that fraud has been exposed and force is all they have left. When I was in Leipzig, when I was in Leipzig, there would be candlelit vigils every week, run mostly out of the Lutheran church, 70 people, 100 people, and then suddenly 70,000 people. Even the organizers of that movement didn't know why at that moment people broke through the barriers of fear implanted by the Stasi state to join them. And Honecker, Eric Honecker, the dictator, called on an elite paratroop division to go down to Leipzig and fire on the crowd. And when their paratroopers got there, they refused. Honecker was gone within a week. It is the pillars, the corruption and rot within the corporate state is so extensive. And believe me, those within that elite understand how corrupt power is, how gamed power is far better than anyone in this room. And so do those cops who for $37 an hour have to work as rena cops or rena security guards at places like Goldman Sachs and watching these guys in their $8,000 suits walk by them as if they're invisible. The power we have comes through transparency. It comes through true democracy. It comes through consensus. And it comes through nonviolence. At this moment, that is the most potent weapon we have. And the security state will seek to paint us another way. Every act of violence is used by the propaganda machine to frighten the mainstream from joining the movement and justify brutal tactics of police repression. Never underestimate the power of the good to draw the good. 
When I was in Prague covering the Velvet Revolution every evening in the Magic Lantern Theater with Václav Havel and Klaus and all of those who would finally inherit the government of Czechoslovakia when the communists fell. There were posters throughout the streets of Prague of a student named Jan Panic, who in 1968, to protest the Soviet invasion of his country, lit himself on fire in Wenzelas Square, and four days later died of his burns. When students from Charles University joined the funeral procession, they were broken up by police. The event was never mentioned on the state-controlled media. When his grave became a shrine, they dug up his remains, cremated his body, gave the cremated urns to his mother, and told her that she was not allowed to bury them. Three weeks after the government fell, 10,000 people were in Red Army Square to rename it in his honor. I was in Vensala Square with a half a million people when Marta Kubashaya, who was Czechoslovakia's most popular singer and in 1968 sang an anthem of defiance that saw her once the communist regime was cemented back into place and Juchek was overthrown, turned into a non-person, her recording stock was destroyed, her voice did not appear on the airwaves. She survived by working in a factory that made toys on an assembly line. And when she walked out on that balcony on that winter's night and began to sing, every person around me knew every word. The power of truth, the power of love, not the sentimental love, but the love that Martin Luther King talked about. This is the power that Occupy has harnessed, and it is a power that terrifies the state. With that power, if we hold fast to it, I believe we have the capacity to bring these people down. Thank you. Wonderful speakers. Our final speaker is Elaine Bernard, Executive Director of the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School and the Harvard Trade Union Program. A lifelong union member and activist, Bernard brings a refreshing balance of humor and passion for worker rights to her talks and teaching. She has conducted courses on a wide variety of topics for unions, community groups, universities, and government departments. Her current research and teaching interests are in the area of international comparative labor movements, union leadership and governance, and the role of unions in promoting civil society, democracy, and economic justice. Some of her talks and publications include From Heroes to Zeros, the War on Unions and the Public Sector, Lighting Fires versus Putting Them Out, Creating a Union Organizing Culture, Why Unions Matter to Everyone, Labor Rights as Human Rights, Social Unionism, Labor as a Political Force, Public Sector Workers and the Creation of Public Value, and Creating the Future, Strategic Planning and Strategic Choice for Unions. Please welcome Elaine Bernard. Well, the labor movement sort of had an Occupy moment before Occupy. And that sort of Occupy moment, and what I call an Occupy moment, is that Occupy sort of galvanized public attention. It 
finally allowed folks who've been trying to deal with what the hell's going on to focus the attention on what's wrong. Well, with the labor movement, the sort of Occupy moment came in Wisconsin last year in January 2011. The labor movement had been dealing with and working people with the recession and most people were a little concerned that, you know, having not made billions of dollars in the lead up to the Great Recession, we're all of a sudden finding the, uh, themselves as being blamed for the financial crisis in the states and the budget crisis. There was a midterm election in 2010, and as often happens, the uh, sitting party lost, and Republicans came to government in many states. And seemingly out of the blue, all of a sudden in the state of Wisconsin, Governor Walker introduced a series of draconian uh, attacks on public sector unions. It included uh, uh, attacks on collective bargaining, attacks on their right to organizing, attempts to take away their health care, force them to pay much higher rates, going after pensions, etc. And in fact, not only did this happen in Wisconsin, but in Wisconsin what happened, which has not been seen for a long time in the, uh, with organized labor, is in this very cold state in January, hundreds of people showed up then thousands of people, then tens of thousands of people in below zero weather showed up to protest. And in fact, organized labor itself, especially in DC, was sort of surprised. Sort of, what the hell's happening? You know, our folks aren't taking it. We then saw other states, Ohio. Ohio saw what was happening in Wisconsin and Ohio workers started to mobilize. And across the country, by the way, in 2011, over 50 bills, initiatives, uh, uh, governor um, rights, various things were brought out that were attacks on collective bargaining, worker benefits, right to organize, all aimed at public employees with a very clear program, force the unions to spend down their budgets before the next election cycle, knock them out of politics, uh, and permanently cripple their ability to organize and to be engaged in the community. And it was indeed a war on public sector unions, which by the way is the largest group of union members in the United States. So attacking public employees and public sector unions is about attacking the labor movement. Uh, and so, and we've seen this not only happen in the United States, by the way, uh, it's happening now in Canada. It's happening in the UK. We see the new Cameron government. You know, I've been here when, a number of years ago when we got up and talked about what was going on in the UK and we quoted Margaret Thatcher who said, there's no such thing as society, there's just individuals and their family. Now in the UK, the new Tory Prime Minister says, not that there's no such thing as society, he's saying there's a big society. In other words, it's so big that we don't have to have government, do it yourself. So, uh, you know, Thatcher's not dead yet, uh, alas, but uh, she must be uh, wondering what the hell's going on here. Um, this war on government and the public sector is a long-term campaign uh, you know, Grover Norquist said it very clearly. I simply want to reduce government to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom uh, and drown it in the bathtub. So it's an attempt. And you might wonder, and why, why government matters anyway? I mean, what is a public sector? Why should we care about a war on the public sector? Well, part of it is 
They've been campaigning as if the public sector is this wasteful entity that undermines you know, our ability as a society to live our real lives through the market. And that only the private sector creates wealth, but the public sector sort of consumes it like a, like a Pac-Man. But you know, the problem is that it is the public sector and that is, in fact, a value-creating entity. The public sector creates a particular type of value. It's called public value. It's value we own in common. We used to have a term for that called commonwealth. Those things that we as a society own in common. You know, when you take water, and it's fresh, potable water, that's a form of wealth. If it's public, it's still a form of wealth. When you put it in bottles and sell it, that's not creating wealth, that's transferring wealth. Now get this straight. The transfer of wealth without compensation is called theft, not wealth creation. All the wealth of the world is owned by us, but it has been stolen. So our job is to take it back and to rebuild the Commonwealth. The Occupy movement has had a profound impact on the labor movement. First, it's reminded us about a movement as opposed to an institution. Look, the dirty secret of the labor movement, and nobody would mind me saying this, the dirty secret of the labor movement is the vast majority of card-carrying union members today did not join the labor movement through any sort of action they were not part of an organizing campaign. I speak to tens of thousands of unionists all the time, and I always say to them, who here came to the labor movement, joined a union through an organizing campaign where they joined with fellow members and they won 50% plus one, and they went through a campaign and they won recognition as a sole bargaining agent, and then they negotiate a collective agreement. And I speak to thousands of unionists, and if maybe 1% put their hand up, I know I'm among a group of organizers, because the vast majority of them got a job in a unionized workplace and discovered they were a union member. Now, that's not a criticism, that's just a fact. And so then for the labor institution to once again become a member, it means giving folks a union experience. Now, historically, we did that by mobilizing folks and going on strike, getting involved in campaigns, those sorts of things. Uh, most of that has disappeared. So now, of course, with these latest attacks, we've got folks who have never been involved in organizing, but who are union members and who are all of a sudden discovering that they've got to be more than just card-carrying members of labor mutual support that they've actually got to be involved in a movement and learn again how to organize, learn again what a movement is about. And in fact, a number of organizations have been rising to that occasion. It also means in the public sector, the public sector unions in particular, need to think a little bit about, is it enough to defend what we've got? Is it enough to say, whoa, don't take away my defined benefit pension plan. Don't take away my health care. Now, verbally they can say, don't take it away because I think everybody else should have it. But it's not enough to simply say that.
And I was very pleased for the opening form. We had Roseanne DeMauro and folks from the National uh, uh, Nurses Unite united because they sort of understand to hold on to what you got today, defense won't do it. You have to take the offense. You can't hold on to what you got in the labor movement unless we spread it around, unless we move to not only defend the public services, hell no. These aren't the public services that we want and imagine. The ones we want, can imagine, and deserve are way more robust, are way better. So in healthcare, it's not a matter of, well, you know, we'll just try and, as, you know, registered nurses do a little better. Hell no, healthcare shouldn't be a business. It's a right. And that's why, that's why they stand for it. So Occupy needs to join and become part of, and the labor movement needs to become part of Occupy, and we need to occupy the public sector. We need to occupy also the private sector. We need to imagine what can be, not what is, what should be. And as a labor movement, that means lighting fires instead of putting them out. So, let me end with two things. Over 180 years ago, when de Tocqueville came to America, he said one of the most interesting things. He said, in democratic countries, the knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all other forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all others. What Occupy has rediscovered 100 years later is the knowledge of how to combine. And that is the beginning of the most important knowledge that exists. Today, we're, you know, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the left form, but I'm from the state of Massachusetts, and in Massachusetts, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of one of the most important strikes in the country. It was the Lawrence Textile Strike of 1912. <laughs> Led by women, immigrants, and the theme of that strike is a wonderful theme, I think, to end on. That strike became known as the Bread and Roses Strike. And trust the sisters, trust the sisters to think of this, that great movements aren't only just about defense, aren't only just about what we desire is, you know, shelter, food, the necessities in life. But we also deserve the joy in life, the beauty in life. I want bread, but I want roses too. Thank you. That was great. All the talks were great. Uh, wonderful conclusion, and this is the end of the 2012 Left Forum. Thank you, thank you for coming. Come back next year, bring your comrades, have a good time, and do a lot of movement work between now and then. Bye-bye. Yay!